So, so let's have a think about what happens when we're sampling from a um, uniform distribution on naught to theta. Okay. Now I'm going to draw a graph here where I'm imagining that the parameter theta varies um, like so. Now if uh, theta was uh, 1, then the density would look like this. It's 0 outside naught 1 and it would be equal to 1 between naught and 1 <clears throat> so that I have a total area of 1. <clears throat> if theta was 2, then the density would be uniform on naught to 2 and you can see that basically what happens is that the it's spread out over a wider interval so it only has half the height so the area of this is a half times 2 and it still has an area of 1 <clears throat> so it's really important to think about what happens to the uniform distribution on naught theta as theta changes and this is what's happening when theta is 1 it's distributed like this as theta runs out then the density gets smaller over a larger interval and of course you can see I could halve this again if I go out to 4. Theta has a massive impact on this distribution because it changes the set of possible values. If theta is 1 it's possible to get values between 0 and 1 but a value of 1 and a half or 1.1 is impossible. If theta is 2 then 1 and a half becomes possible so the range of possible values that's a very very important impact that this distribution has. So of course if we're looking at a likelihood um, for a set of observations so let's say that I've observed um, n observations on this random variable x1, x2 up to xn now, I, now they've already been observed and they're fixed and I'm trying to write down a, a likelihood which I'm going to try and factorise to get a sufficient statistic. Let's just say that x1 is there. Now let's say x2 is here and let's say that x3 is here and then x4 is here and so on. As it turns out all the others happen to be spaced out in here. So that of all of them x2 is the smallest, it's the smallest order statistic, the first order statistic, and x3 happens to be the largest. So that's another way of thinking about those numbers. And now let's graph the likelihood of the sample and it's really important you understand how this works. So here's theta and here's the likelihood for this value of theta for this fixed sample here. So let's say that theta is 1. Okay, so the distribution looks like this. What is the chance of observing this sample here? Well, these points are outside of 0, 1. They have no chance at all. So the, the likelihood of this sample coming from an, a uniform distribution on 0, 1 is 0. So the likelihood at 1 is 0. Now here's 2. Well all the points have to be between 0 and 2. And look, x4 and x3 are outside the range. And so for this fixed set of xi, the chance of observing these, if theta is 2, is again 0. So the likelihood is 0. And you can see the likelihood is 0 here for any value of theta which is below any of the xi. And so the first point at which you get any likelihood at all is at x3 in this case, but not because it's x3, but because it's the maximum one. Right? So when theta reaches this point, the density might look like, um, it might come across here like this, say. Theta is equal to x3. And then the likelihood at x4 is that, the likelihood at x1 is that, at x2 is that, and the same thing here at x3. And you can see that each one of those is in fact just 1 over theta. Um, the height of this is always 1 over theta, and it gets smaller and smaller as theta gets bigger. And so I've just got 1 over theta to the 4.
and so I can graph that here. I'm going to be at zero all the way until I reach this point here, which is the maximum of the xi. And at that point, the likelihood jumps up. And it's this times this times this times this, which is 1 over theta to the fourth power. Now let's see what happens to the likelihood as we run out here. As theta gets bigger and bigger, let's say I come right out to here, you can see that the height is going to come down. I'm going to have to come down to, I won't dot it all the way along, but I'm going to have to come down to a height that's something like this. It's certainly smaller than that. And so the likelihood of this becomes that. And of course they all have the same likelihood because it's a uniform distribution. But the important thing that you see is that as theta gets bigger than x3, the likelihood gets smaller for all of them, and that's raised to the fourth power. And so it's going to be monotonic decreasing. It's going to come down like this. And it's really just a graph of 1 over theta, 1 over theta to the fourth power. Okay, And so once we've figured that out, we understand the role of theta, we can write down that the likelihood of any uh, particular sample, uh, given that the value is theta, is going to be 1 over theta to the fourth power times this indicator function here as to whether um, theta is bigger than the maximum of the of the xi. Okay, theta has to get past the biggest one because otherwise there are values bigger than theta and um, the likelihood will be zero. So I get this expression here. So of course if I think about this in terms of a random sample, so in other words I write this down in terms of the random variables if I have a look at this likelihood, I'm writing down exactly the same expression. I've got a 1 over theta um, to the, well, here, uh, well, sorry, no, it's 1 over theta uh, to the n. That's a bit confusing, sorry. I mixed up 4 and n. I'm assuming that there's a sample size n here, so I'll have n of them, and I'll have 1 over theta to the n. Um, and I'll be multiplying that by the indicator function as to whether theta is bigger than the maximum of the xi. Now if I use the factorization theorem, I have to write this likelihood as a function of theta and the sufficient statistic. Well, there's the sufficient statistic. And then I have to multiply by, I'm going to multiply by 1. Right? And so this is of the form some function of the sufficient statistic, which is the maximum of the xi and theta, multiplied by a function only of the data, which in this case happens to be uh, the function 1. And theref therefore I've shown that the only thing of interest to me in the sample, in terms of making inferences about theta, is to find out what the maximum value is. That contains all of the information about theta. And so one might then ask the question, well, OK, if I've got um, naught to theta here, and I've got a density which is constant at a height of 1 over theta, and I observe a sample of, say, 3, and, and let's say that I know that the biggest one is here, and let's call that x, x3. We can also, for short, write it as a y. So let's say that's y3. Imagine you've got this uniform distribution on naught theta, and you've observed the maximum. Conditional on that, what do you think the distribution would be of the other two observations? You know that they must be in here between 0 and that, because this one's the maximum. So the other two were smaller than that. And we're just guessing. We can prove it. But, but, but I think it's pretty intuitively clear that what will happen is that the other two observations will be uniformly distributed over the interval between 0 
and whatever the maximum value was. And that's why knowing them doesn't, doesn't help you to make any inference about theta once you know the maximum. Once you know the maximum, the other two are uniformly distributed below. The conditional distribution of the other two, given the sufficient statistic, is not a function of um, theta. And we can prove that. Um, the theory you'll learn uh, a little bit later, maybe you're not fully across it now, but I just want to show it. I just want to show it to you. So here's a proof, basically. I'm going to take a sample of size 3 from my uniform on naught theta. That's x1, x2, and x3. I'm going to put them in order, the minimum, the middle one, and the maximum. And I want to call them y1, y2, and y3. It's just a bit easier to think about them that way. But I could also write it as x1 with a bracket, the minimum, the middle one, and the maximum one. And what I'm interested in doing is looking at the distribution of the bottom two, y1 and y2, given the sufficient statistic. And using standard probability theory, which you should remember, this is just the joint distribution of y1, y2 and y3 divided by the marginal distribution for y3. I don't expect you to, to know this at this point. You'll learn more later. But the joint distribution of the three order statistics is really uh, got by multiplying the, uh, the distribution that you're sampling from, uh, the likelihood multiplied out, and you just have to multiply by a, an n factorial. So the sample size here is 3. And, and this is for order statistics. So we know that y1 is the minimum. It has to be less than y2. It has to be less than y3. And they all lie in the interval between naught and theta. So basically, you take the density, which is 1 over theta, and you cube it. And because you have these limits here, you, you introduce a 3 factorial. <clears throat> so take it for granted at the moment that that is the joint distribution. There's a very nice, simple argument for getting the distribution of the maximum. Consider the distribution function for the maximum, capital F, Y3. So this is the largest of the three observations which are on naught theta. So its value at y3 is the probability, by definition, that the maximum value is less than or equal to y3. Now, the only way the maximum value can be less than or equal to y3 is if all three of the xi are smaller than y3. And the probability that any one of them is less than y3 is just given by the probability that x1 is less than or equal to y3. And they're all independent. So you just have to look at that probability and cube it. The important thing being here that the maximum is only less than y3 if all of the individual xi are less than y3. And this is just the distribution function for one observation uh, cubed. And the distribution function for uniform on naught theta is just equal to, um, if it's evaluated at y3, it's y3 over theta cubed. If I want to get the density, I have to differentiate the distribution function. So I differentiate that and I get 3 y3 squared over y cubed. And then I calculate this ratio. And just like we saw in general in the first video, what happens miraculously is that theta cancels out. I have a 3 factorial 1 over theta cubed here, and there's a 1, there's a one over theta cubed here too. And so the function that I get does not depend on theta. And in fact, you can write it, the 3 cancels out here, you can write it as 2 times 1 on y3 times 1 on y3. This is similar in form to this, but n is now 2, and instead of the distribution being uniform on 1 to theta, so that this is 1 over theta, it's now uniform on 0 to y3, and the density is therefore 1 on y3. So if you believe this is the joint distribution for order statistics, this is the joint distribution of a sample of size 2 for the order statistics from a uniform on 0 to y3, which is exactly what we were suggesting uh, before. If you condition on the size of the maximum, then the other two observations are uniformly distributed between 0 and the maximum. And this is effectively a proof, although I don't expect you to follow all, all of the details. Now, when you look at this slight variation, where instead of going from 0 to theta, we go from minus theta on 2 to theta on 2, the second distribution in question 2, 
This is still a distance of theta, so the density is still 1 over theta. But we need to make sure that all of the xi fall within the interval where there's non-zero density. So we can't afford for any of our x's to be below minus theta on, on 2 or bigger than theta on 2. So if we write the density out similarly to the way we did it for a uniform on naught theta, and I'll leave you to think about the details, but you should be able to be confident of this, the likelihood is 1 over theta to the n times this indicator function. So this function is 1 if the minimum value that you see is bigger, is above minus theta on 2, and 0 otherwise. And this indicator function is 1 if the maximum x value that you see is below theta on 2 and 0 otherwise. It simply amounts to saying that if this is the, like, if this is the distribution, then the likelihood of any set of x's where there's an x below this lower limit or above that lower limit has to be 0. And by the factorization theorem, we can see now that this is a function of theta and two statistics, the minimum and the maximum, and we multiply that by one in the usual way. And so now it's not sufficient for this to know where the maximum is. For naught to theta, it was fine because all of the values stopped at zero. But now the values go down to minus theta on 2. And we need information about that as well. So the way we describe this situation is that if I want to get all the information from the sample that's relevant to theta, there are two jointly sufficient statistics, the minimum and the maximum. If I know what those are, then there's no other useful information left in the rest of the numbers. And so the way we summarise this is we say that in this case, um, x1, the minimum, and xn, the, the maximum, are joint, jointly sufficient. for theta. And that completes that problem. So now I want you to go on and uh, have a think about question three. And when you do that, think very, very carefully about the role that theta plays for each of the three distributions there. Those three cases have been chosen to show you an evolution in the way in which the parameter affects the distribution.